Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this exciting policy proposal webinar on investing in healthy farms for the future. We have with us a super lineup of speakers and respondents. My name, firstly, is Tamara Harris, and I am with the Sustainable Farms team based in Cowra. Um, but firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we meet on today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. A quick run through of logistics for how webinars work. Many of you would be pretty familiar with that now. Questions are encouraged. You've got a couple of options down the bottom. Um, in the Q&A box, if you put any questions to your um, to the presenters or the respondents, and they'll get answered at the end. If you've got any technical questions, if you can't hear or see or something like that, then pop them in the chat box. That will be, um, and we'll get someone to help you with those as much as we can. As an attendee, you are muted and no one can see you. So if you need to have your lunch or duck away, that's fine. And on that note, it is being recorded. So no stress if you have to leave, you can come back and watch it at any stage. We will aim to have it all done by 1.15. Um, our wonderful speakers today, we have Michelle Young, who's the Director of the Sustainable Farms team, Professor David Lindemann, who is the Lead Scientist for Sustainable Farms and Research Director for Ecology at ANU, Ruth Chapman, who is an ANU economist, and our respondents, which we are delighted to have with, with us, Ash Saladini, a Chief Economist and General Manager of Trade with the National Farmers Federation, and Mark Lewis, a Board Member with the Regional Investment Corporation. David and Bruce will be presenting via PowerPoint to you today, and then Ash and Mark will be the respondents, and then Michelle Young will facilitate the Q&A session at the end. On that note, I will um, hand over to Michelle to oh. give us an overview of Sustainable Farms. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Tamara. Um, welcome, everybody. It's very exciting to have you here at our first uh, public policy webinar. We've been running events um, about on-ground practices um, since COVID shut down, but this is our first webinar about policy issues, and we're very grateful to have Ash and Mark here with us today. Uh, just a few words about Sustainable Farms before we start so you know where this work is located. We are based at the Australian National University, and we work on farms in the southwest slopes of New South Wales and Victoria, running between Orange and Shepparton. Our vision is to empower farmers to adopt management practices that have a direct benefit for biodiversity conservation, as well as farm profitability um, and social benefits, including uh, improving mental health and wellbeing for farmers. We're a transdisciplinary team. Um, our research researchers here at the ANU are specialists in finance, health, ecology, social sciences and statistics. And we have a team of field ecologists who live and work um, in locations across our project area. So this team of field ecologists um, are supported by engagement officers and they're out on farms every day. They're monitoring biodiversity and rocky outcrops, plantings, new plantings, remnants, shelter belts, native grasslands and farm dams. And they're also in the paddock talking with farmers either one-to-one -one about decisions they're taking or running workshops, um, a field days. Um, uh, and we're about to start those again as we come out of the restrictions. So the inspiration and purpose of our work uh, is embedded in our relationships with our um, farmers and our collaborations with local land services, catchment management authorities, and land care groups. Um, through the, the Lindemeyer Lab, our field ecologists for the last 20 years have been monitoring the investments on farms that have been made with the support of land care and NRM agencies. So it's been a collaborative learning journey and it continues today as we work on new projects with our partners around metrics and measures for sustainability. Um, all of our work is based on the evidence from these very unique long-term data sets and that's what enables us to support land care and LLS with their planning um, supports farmers with their decision making and here at the ANU is providing the opportunity for researchers to explore these relationships between uh, farming sustainably, supporting biodiversity and the outcomes for profitability and farmer health and well-being. At a policy level, our goal is uh, to support the work of our regional partners um, and our farmer network and we aim to do that by improving and expanding the framework that government and industry provide for supporting investment in natural assets on farms. 
So I'm going to hand it to David now to kick off today's discussion about uh, why we need new policy frameworks for investment. I'd encourage you to fire any questions you have into the chat, either about what the presenters are talking about or about the Sustainable Farms Project. If I'll be um, putting those questions to the presenters when, when they're finished. And um, if we don't get to all of your questions, we're going to send out a summary. So we'll make sure that everything's addressed through that summary. So thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to um, try and make sure that I've, I've got the right um, slide presentation up. Is, is that the right one? I can't tell from here. Yep, David looks great. Okay, terrific. Thank you. So what I wanted to do very briefly to introduce this policy um, webinar is to talk about the natural assets on farms and the, the challenge around those very briefly. So one of the key things is the extent of the problem in degraded land around Australia and globally, and the need for long-term work to inform restoration success. And that really leads to this notion of, of thinking about the funding for these challenges and perhaps some alternative models of financing, which uh, Bruce Chapman will take up from here. So I'm having trouble moving this, this screen. Let's see if we can go to the third one. So one of the most influential studies that I've seen in many years is the extent of degraded land globally. So this is from a paper in 2015, indicating the, the extent of, of degradation. And it really is uh, quite sobering to see what's happening. And Australia isn't exempt from this uh, if we look at Australia and Oceania, as we can see in this, this um, highlighted area, there are many tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of hectares of uh, degraded arable land in Australia and not only globally. So if we go globally, we see that we have an area the size of Russia, the world's largest country, that is degraded arable land. And that directly impacts three point two billion people. And when we come to an Australian context, we can see that extensive land clearing and land degradation are really a major problem. For example, in Queensland, we're looking at about 1.2 million hectares over that period 2012 to 2016. And we have other problems uh, associated with land degradation, for example, the amount of salt affected land, and that in, as well as extensive soil degradation. So some of the reasons that these are important is that there's presently legislation in places such as Germany where the, the chain of custody in terms of food security and the trade in products is going to start to, to be part of legislation. And so there's been, going to be concerns around what is truly sustainable. So the estimates are that that impact of degraded arable land globally would cost up to $14 trillion to fix. And that's an estimate from late last year for some people working in Brazil in this, in this space. So in Australian farm context, we're talking about pretty close to two thirds of the Australian continent. Therefore, we've really got to get this balance right between the environmental condition of the land, the productivity of the land, biodiversity, animal welfare, carbon storage. These are huge challenges that the nation really has to, to front up to. So there's some interesting back of the envelope calculations here. This, this is um, a couple of slides stolen from a colleague of ours. And, and she was really looking at the, the total cost of and, and effort just in, in a Victorian context for how much it's going to take to, to repair some of the degraded land just in that state. So we can see that uh, there's about 10,000 hectares of revegetation every year but there's about 4,000 hectares of, of native vegetation lost. So we've got a difference roughly of 6,000 hectares and we know how much land needs remediation. So it's gonna take us 104 years to, um, to achieve um, sensible levels of revegetation given the present dynamics. 
And this is stolen from um, Dr. Wilson, who presented some material at a catchment management authority meeting uh, recently. So one of the aims of the sustainable farms project is to think about the natural assets on farms and what might be able to be done in terms of restoration and remediation, thinking about the balance between productivity, profitability, biodiversity, uh, land condition. And there are some really important points here. First, first of all is that many farmers actually don't recognize the natural assets particularly well on their, on their properties. And we know that in the past, there's been some really uh, major efforts from government to, to look at these kinds of problems, natural heritage trust, caring for our country um, and the like. But the sheer scale of the degra degradation problem and the land, uh, land condition problem is, is uh, quite overwhelming. And often the reach of the grants is limited relative to the uh, ability to restore some of those natural assets. So for example, for the best part of a decade, we were involved in uh, an environmental stewardship program uh, where there were remediation and restoration efforts on 158 farms in the box gum grassy woodlands of uh, New South Wales, uh, right up to Southeast Queensland. That is an estimate at best of 0.5 of 1% of the farms in that area. So there are some other key, key issues here. One is that there can be some quite substantial productivity gains from improving the condition of assets. And we'll talk about an example in a moment, but often it takes some time for those profitability productivity gains to be realized uh, after restoration and efforts and other management interventions. And so those kinds of delays are potentially problematic for con conventional types of loans where the repayments would commence immediately. So the best way to think about this is uh, with an actual example. And one of the initiatives within the Sustainable Farms Project is to look at how we can better manage farm dams. And there's some really encouraging perspectives here in terms of what it does for water persistence, drought resilience, uh, profitability, improved biodiversity outcomes, and even mental health outcomes, where farmers actually establish picnic areas um, around their farm dams. And it might sound a little bit trivial, but in the middle of a drought, when you have a farm dam that's in good condition, it's actually really important for farmer mental health. So we know that there's at least 650,000 dams in the Murray-Darling Basin alone. And at the time of the, the last drought, about 97% of them were in very poor condition. And the small number of studies that have been done globally, and I mean globally and small in this, in this context, is that poor quality water can uh, impair livestock weight gain by up to 23% and perhaps even more. We also know that, that farm dams in poor quality condition are actually a very major source of greenhouse gas emissions through methane, nitrous oxide and others. And we know that there's been billions of dollars spent on livestock breeding, pasture improvement, and there's precious little published information about relationships between livestock weight gain and water quality. So one of the, the outreach programs within, within sustainable farms is to think about how you can renovate and improve farm dams so that you have better quality water that lasts longer and that should allow better weight gain in livestock. And we can actually see the transition uh, through practical ex examples on farms. But more recently, one of the initiatives within sustainable farms is to actually do a cost benefit analysis of these changes. And this has been led by Leo Dobes and, and Tim Higgins here at ANU. And the numbers are really quite striking in terms of the per farm net benefit and the overall net economic benefit of management interventions to improve the quality of water, to boost livestock weight gain. And there are some other benefits that come from this for example, a biodiversity dividend and a mental health dividend. So what I want to do now is to turn this across to, to Bruce Chapman to pick this up in terms of some insights into sustainable financing for changing the condition of natural assets on farms. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. That was 
really interesting and some big numbers there in terms of the scale of the problem. Um, we'll just hand over to Bruce now to interest us all in some economics. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm, I feel quite privileged to be able to talk about this topic. It's the part of the background is that it's not that common for different, very different parts of the university to work so closely together. And that's what we're doing here. And I think it's been a great privilege. I've learned a huge amount from being involved in this project. So I want to talk to you about a different way of understanding financing issues, a different way of conceptualising the whole concept of borrowing and all in the context of the funding that might be needed, is certainly needed for environmentally sustainable investments in agriculture. Uh, this is my outline. I won't go through the outline. I'll let you look at that. But while you're looking at that, I'll just give you a little bit of background. My involvement in financing issues started about 30 years ago when I helped design the higher education contribution scheme. And it wasn't too long after that that I started working with Linda Botterill. She's a professor at the University of, Cam of Canberra in um, political science. And we were very interested in whether or not we could take some of the lessons from the HEX system, which is what we call a contingent loan, and put them into other areas of economic activity, particularly agriculture. Now, at that stage, the, uh, there was an awful lot of money going to farmers uh, in time of drought, and we thought that there might be a fairer way of handling that through a contingent debt. So I'll explain what a contingent debt means in a little while and talk to you about some modelling that I've been doing with Madeline Dunk on how this might work with respect to environmentally sustainable agricultural um, investments. The current problem with the government, David's already touched on this, uh, what governments typically have done in the past and still do is to provide grants for farmers for in investments and they've got major problems in, in our view. Uh, the first issue is that there's a huge cost involved and David tells me that something like $2 trillion per annum is uh, goes in form of grants from government to, uh, to farm properties for these uh, for these particular hoped for investments, many of which don't work out in the way that they've been designed to. Sometimes government put rules around the way that the money can be used. It's not apposite for particular properties and uh, can be wasted. But the first and biggest point is that there's a very substantial amount of money here. And I might say, as an aside, the more money that the governments have that are used just for grants instead of loans, then the less coverage will there be per property. And I'll get onto that in a minute. One of the points that Linda and I think really matters in terms of governments giving grants to farmers is the whole concept of regressivity or progressivity. The, the economic word regressive means essentially their, their behaviours which distribute towards uh, relatively advantaged groups and away from relatively disadvantaged groups. And the basic point here is that with grants coming from government, they all they obviously definitionally are uh, financed by all taxpayers. The average taxpayer does less well in a financial or wealth sense over her or his lifetime than a typical farm property. So uh, it's that's that's a very important point about regressivity. Our associate John Mitchell has uh, done some work on this to illustrate the extent to which farm farm properties are better off than typical taxpayers. That doesn't mean that farms are in a, are in a situation where they're, they're able to finance what they want. Of course, that's not true. Finance is needed for all kinds of things. But the big point about regressivity is one that I think has motivated uh, the work that Linda and I did and now the work I'm doing with David. And as I said right at the beginning, governments really don't know that much about what a particular property needs. And so the grants could be targeted inappropriately because governments don't want them to look too flexible or too open to potential abuse. Uh, but that's not an effective mechanism to address the problem that David has been uh, alluding to. Uh, I thought I should have at least one picture. Uh, this is my picture. 
I think it's extremely potent as an illustration of what can happen uh, internationally, worldwide, in terms of the amount of money that goes inappropriately and regressively, I might say, in general, to farm properties. Uh, I'm sad to say there are no more pictures. I've got some, I've got some graphs to share with you in a minute. So the investment finding, financing issue for the government, I think is pretty clear. How do you maximise the effectiveness of the outlays uh, in ways that are flexible enough for the farms to be making the decisions, the farmers to be making the decisions themselves about what are the appropriate investment projects? Let's now look at the issues for the farm. One of the most important points in trying to understand agriculture and its idiosyncrasies is to note that the that farms experience very high variance in, uh, in revenue streams and in profits. And that comes about for all sorts of reasons, for drought, for flood, for the vagaries of international prices, for international trade struggles between countries. And it's extremely important that it's close to unique, actually, the needs for farmers to have what we call income smoothing. Income smoothing is basically what all debt is about. When people borrow money for particular projects, the bank is saying to them, look, you haven't got the money now, but why don't we just spread it out over 10, 15 for a mortgage, 30 years? That's income smoothing. And the, the type of loan that I'll be talking about is just an example of income smoothing. It just happens to be a very pre precise form. And the reason that the agriculture needs income smoothing is to smooth out the vagaries of uh, the revenue fluctuations and also to help manage risk. And risk is completely important in trying to understand the difficulties or potential difficulties that there might be for farm properties choosing to invest in particular projects that are good for the sustainment uh, of the environment. David pointed out that it takes time to improve properties and to get the return from the property improvement. It might take 10 years for a shelter bill to start to impact on revenue streams. And that's a situation in which a normal bank loan becomes a bit tricky because of course the banks will require the money to be repaid straight away and not depending on capacity to pay. Uh, and that might be well before the investment returns start coming in for the property. So this is a concern for using only commercial borrowing. I'm certainly not going to be arguing that there should not be commercial borrowing. Absolutely necessary is to have commercial borrowing, but it could be complemented with revenue contingent loans, which I'll be talking about. If a farm only has commercial loans, then that's tied to the prospect of foreclosure. And if you want to make somebody very unhappy, you take away a property that there's been in the, in the family for generations, and that is one of the important issues of risk in trying to understand commercial borrowing. The economics of contingent debt, if you know somebody with a hex debt or you've got one yourself, then you kind of get it a little bit. Contingent debt is a phrase which means that you pay, repay a loan only when and if you have the capacity to do so. With the HEX system, it's based on personal income and anyone earning less than $47,000 per annum pays nothing. So it's very unlike a normal bank loan where you have to pay a certain given amount uh, at a constant level over a set time period. The great advantage of uh, contingent debt is insurance. It means that if you don't have the resources at a particular point in time, then you are able to defer. In fact, automatically it is deferred if you don't have the money to repay a contingent debt. And so that insurance aspect, which I think is absolutely key, uh, has a particular importance with respect to agriculture because it offers insurance against default. It offers insurance against foreclosure. So th this is the critical point. These kind of debts uh, provide income smoothing and default insurance. And we know an awful lot about that with respect to the experience of HEX internationally. Put the line back on. Um, so I now want to talk about our modelling. I've did, done this with uh, Madeline Dunk. We, we understand, and so I'm going to illustrate uh, with respect to four different types of properties. They, they different, they're different with respect to revenue streams. It's really important that these systems are designed in a way 
that guarantees that the government gets the maximum amount of money back. And so to cope with that issue, we've capped the debt depending on the previous revenue history uh, of the property. So uh, the, the slide will show you what the parameters are. 8% of annual revenue is collected to repay the debt. So if in year one, you've got no revenue because there's a drought or a flood or whatever, it does not matter, but you'll pay 8% uh, of, the, of that revenue stream down the track. We've put an interest rate on it. I've done dynamic simulations. It's not just an average. We've moved the properties artificially from low to medium to high, just to see what it looks like. These are the uh, parameters that we've got. We've got four different types of farm informed by ABARES data uh, on the basis of their size with respect to revenue and the debts have been capped. You can see that in the bottom row. Um, this is what actually happens with these arrangements. These are the revenue contingent repayments. So for the four different revenue farm classifications, the picture shows that for the highest property, the highest revenue firm uh, farms with the with the biggest debts of $250,000. You can see that there's a big differences in uh, over time in what gets paid. That's because we've made the revenue uh, quite disparate over time. The critical point is that uh, for the high debt properties with the high revenue, you'll get all the money back with these parameters within about two or three years. And when you look at all the properties taken as a whole, and the next slide shows you the cumulative repayments on the basis of the historical revenue streams, the money is all coming back with these parameters. We need better modelling than this. We need much more sophisticated modelling than this, and it is illustrative uh, only, but I think that we've done enough to show that this is of great, should be of great interest if the government can actually get most of this money back fairly quickly. And in present value terms, if there's a real interest rate on the debt, the cost of the budget are potentially zero. The, the final slide shows the total proportion repaid um, by all the farms after, after four years, all the money is back in these particular examples. Um, I now want to talk a little bit about uh, collection. The collection mechanisms, we're not, we are, I was going to say we're not boffins, but we are boffins, but, but we're practical and we've looked at different ways of collecting. This is not hex for farmers. This is not on the basis of personal income. You won't get the money back because farmers' personal incomes are too low. And you don't really want to use profit because profit is open to all kinds of gaming, if you like, and it can be manipulated in various ways for the timing with depreciation allowances or whatever you, but what can't be changed legally is revenue. And the farm properties, like all businesses in Australia, has an obligation with the business activity statement to report revenue every quarter, and it cannot be manipulated. And so we've used revenue on advice from um, rural accountants and from uh, farmers. The, far, the accountant we talked to most was Michael Egan, and Michael Egan sat down with us all, uh, many years ago to ask how could farms avoid repaying, and we think tying it to the uh, Australian business number and to revenue is the way to handle this, and he was quite confident, and so have other uh, accountants we've spoken to, that the money would be repaid. I want to finish now, uh, and certainly I, I want to invite you to ask lots of questions about this. There's plenty of work that we've done. I'd love to share it with you. But one point to make at the end, which I think is extremely important, is that nobody's talking about revenue contingent loans uh, as if they are a replacement for commercial debt. And indeed, the way to think about this, I think, is partnerships between banks and government and farms. Commercial debt is completely important to farmers but the, and, and, to, and to all small business, of course. But one way of making the repayment more likely would be to have that in combination with a revenue contingent loan. So imagine that a bank wants to uh, um, provide a loan for like $500,000 for property improvements for environmentally sustainable 
investments. They expect the money to start coming back straight away. But of course, the returns won't come straight away. If there was a top up revenue contingent loan from the government, that would allow the farm property to repay the commercial bank in that period before the returns come through. So think about this. We think about this in partnership terms. The modelling, we've just started to do the modelling, which looks at this in more detail. The data I've shared with you today are purely about the, the government side of it, but that's not where we want to stop this discussion. We want this to be seen as a financing arrangement that includes commercial banks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. That was fascinating. It was really, really great. Um, we now, I'll invite Ash to um, show us his video, show us his wonderful face. Thanks, Ash, from National Farmers Federation um, to give us his response to those two presentations and the paper in general. Thanks, Ash. Great, thank you. Look, firstly, I wanted to thank Sustainable Farms for providing the NFF the opportunity to participate in this forum. Uh, we believe that farmers can play a key role in providing environmental services, whether it's land management, biodiversity, carbon offsets, or other outcomes, other environmental outcomes. So for those of you who don't know us, the NFF is the national peak body representing the agricultural sector uh, with members from across the state farming organizations and commodity groups. We believe there are significant opportunities to improve environmental services and farming outcomes uh, by incentivizing farmers via market-based mechanisms to undertake what we call environmental services. Um, as a sustainable farms research paper shows, there are many benefits and synergies between a focus on sustainability and financial outcomes. And the paper highlights that sustainable practices lead to long-term um, higher farm output. We believe there are more benefits than just improved farm outputs to this synergy, uh, synergist relationship. If these environmental and land management services have a financial incentive attached to them, can become a powerful source of off-farm income that is uncorrelated to climatic and weather cycles, and then thus becomes a powerful tool to mitigate the effects of things like drought. And that's something that we've been talking about for the last five years, and it's been a big impact on the farming sector. The other opportunity is new market opportunities, um, with market access around the world being now tied to environmental performance, um, farmers being able to demonstrate um, their environmental uh, performance will actually open up new markets, or at the very least, um, give them access to existing markets. And I note that the European Union is doing a lot of work around linking environmental performance to market access. So there's some benefits just outside of pure land management um, sort of um, outcomes here. Now, the incentivization of farmers to provide these services will not happen automatically. Governments need to undertake the groundwork to create the markets for these services. There needs to be a clear and well-defined pathway to accessing these incentives for farmers. Uh, there needs to be practical, easily implementable certification reporting frameworks tailored to the variety of farming systems. And certification, reporting and revenues from environmental services should complement the main business of farmers. And in the end, the farmers are in the business of farming. So it needs to really um, be heavily linked to their main business. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in, in the form of challenges um, in terms of environmental services. So what are some of these challenges? Uh, revenues from environmental offsets are treated as off-farm income. And this has implica implications for risk management tools available to farmers. As an example, if a farmer earns more than $100,000 in off-farm income, they're no longer eligible to invest money in farm management deposit schemes for that year. And that's a real um, sort of loss of a tool to um, uh, mitigate some of the risk um, from that ups and downs of um, revenue that farmers do face. Cash flow is another significant uh, issue for farmers who tend to be asset rich and cash poor. The tax treatment of environmental offsets perpetuates issues with cash flow for farmers. Um, as capital gains is due at the point where certificates are created, not at the point where farmers receive the financial benefit. And this potentially um, creates a large out-of-pocket um, um, for the farmers until that certificate is sold. Now, I've also heard there are other implication, uh, imp implications of certification um, and credits in the form of land prices and access to finance. Um, but again, I haven't looked at into this um, in any great detail. So that's probably an anecdotal sort of, um, or hearsay um, from what I've heard. Now, this forum is about the role of finance and debt. Um, so it'd be remiss of me not to mention some high level points. 
First of all, it's unclear whether banks would recognize certificates as an asset, um, but I would say if we're going to set up such markets, um, that would be fundamental to any scheme. The second point around banks is around um, that banks are increasingly looking at sustainability of farms as a credit risk. So any certification scheme or any scheme incentivizing farmers to provide these environmental services should try to align with those um, the credit risk that the banks are um, imposing on farmers. And aligning these principles means you can tick two boxes um, with the, the, the one effort, basically. Now, with respect to revenue contingent loan, I think um, I would agree with a lot of um, comments made earlier by the earlier speakers, but I think there's a few um, additional sort of points that we can make here as well. First of all, we believe this would be great for young farmers and farmers who are asset poor, particularly those who are undertaking um, different forms of um, farming businesses, such as leasehold farming, those who do not have assets and cannot secure debt uh, to participate in such activities. So we think there's a broader set of sort of um, uh, benefits to uh, revenue contingent loans um, above and beyond what, what has been previously mentioned. And I might just uh, leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Great. Um, I'll get Mark to come on now. Um, as I mentioned before, Mark with the Regional Investment Corporation. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mara, and welcome, everybody. And uh, still good morning for us over here, uh, West Australia. Um, very interesting topic, um, very close to some of the heart of what we're about at the RIC, at the Regional Investment Corporation. Um, and I'll just probably elaborate on some of that, but for those that don't know, aware of RIC, Regional Investment Corporation, we have about $4 billion now after the last budget for uh, concessional loans into farming and very much targeted at uh, agricultural risk and uh, drought resilience. So a lot of the things that um, both David and, and Bruce have been talking about are very much part of that. So in short, we will loan for water retention practices, fencing to land systems and fencing for protection, controlled grazing systems, soil remediation, changing farming systems to pasture, to include pasture improvements, re-veg uh, and genetic improvements. So there's a whole range of things that uh, whoever wants to put in for an application to RIC will uh, we'll look at that. But very much it's about anything that increases production, uh, increases profitability, increases the resource base is, is very much what we're targeting. Um, now, I guess going to Bruce's um, uh, suggestions around the way that uh, the government may be able to intervene, there's obviously a range of suites of things. And, you know, and I noticed in income smoothing, there's section 36 triple A in the income, in the ATA, in the income, is an income um, smoothing provision that's already there. It's a five year smoothing provision that acts. So there are a lot of stuff that's there. But I am particularly interested in, in the notion of revenue contingency loans and or debt. And um, it is something that I've been involved in, uh, in, in probably another sphere, which is more around uh, in the insurance based stuff, which I guess he's, he, he's alluding to and, 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 and working towards. But, you know, I think we've all heard of multi-peril insurance and there's been some problems and issues with that over time, particularly around the cost of providing that insurance. Uh, I think we're getting to a point now where we can look at um, insurance, income protection insurance, which is now getting into the ballpark of being affordable. But I'll just go back in terms of, and I agree, I think the, the traditional uh, loans facilities, that the, the likes of RIC and, and others uh, provide for government, are a clunky core debt based uh, instrument. Um, they're they've got asset securitization issues. Um, rightly, Bruce is pointing out that um, the, the income and revenue flows are, are all over the shop. So why would we have a, uh, you know, a, a set um, re, uh, return or revenue requirement on, on our loans? Um, to some degree, we, we don't. We, we have a five-year interest only facility and a five-year core debt uh, in, uh, principal and interest at the other end. So there are ways to um, uh, ameliorate some of that. But in essence, I, I do agree, we, we need to look at probably more, uh, more FinTech related um, approaches these days, which uh, look at a whole different way of securitizing assets. And um, there are some 
interesting things coming up on the horizon. So we'll be keeping a watching brief on that. But really, to go to Bruce's issue, um, uh, I think we 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 it would do us well to to look at the paper that he's got and other papers that he's got. And I, I note that he did say something about uh, for younger farmers. And I, I we we are I think in first January starting up a an ag restart alone, which allows succession planning and that to go on with, uh, within agriculture. And I would like very much to introduce this revenue contingent loan or debt facility as part of that, uh, part of that thinking because we aren't, it isn't set in concrete at the moment. And it's, uh, it's a, there's an opportunity to, to look at this approach uh, on that basis. But um, look, Overall, I think we are all robustly agreeing with each other in that, um, you know, if we get um, the tools and, and the incentives in place, that we can really move towards uh, increasing the, the resource base of the, 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 the industry, if you like, and, and that can only lead to production increases and, and the profitability that comes from that. So, as I said, I think we're all robustly agreeing with each other and uh, I, I look forward to the discussion going forward. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we've got a few questions coming through there now. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will now move to the question and answer session. So um, Michelle Young, as I introduced before, is the Director of Sustainable Farm. She'll convene the Q&A session. We're also live streaming via YouTube, which is a technological first for us at Sustainable Farm. So, that was probably a day of our lives we'll never get back, but it seems to be working so far. Um, so for the Q&A session, I will get the other presenters and respondents to show us your beautiful faces. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Michelle to attack those questions, but keep them coming through. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Tamara. That's great. Um, we've got a few questions, quite varied, which is interesting. So. The first question is from Cecilia, um, and I think it goes to an issue that government is sort of concerned about in terms of the RCL. Cecilia is asking, how is farm net benefit framed and measured? And I, I know when we've talked to policy people and the department before, they're concerned about how if, you, you know, if you're using an RCL, where the, um, where the subsidy kicks in. So, Bruce, could you talk a bit more about how it's measured and how the subsidy would work? I'm not exactly sure what the question means. Could you rephrase it? I can't hear that. How far net benefit is framed and measured? So I guess the thing is, what, what Cecilia is probably asking, I think, is uh, if we're looking at what the outcomes are from, from the loans, so the government's making an investment through the RCL uh, in terms of you know, the, the interest rate that it sets on the loan. I and so how's that how's that related to what kind of benefit the farmer receives I see. from yeah. the investment? Uh, these systems can be designed with or without subsidies. Uh, the basic economics of uh, public policy is that if there's seen to be a social benefit, then the, there is a case for a subsidy. But you can, you can envisage what we call the externalities from the properties being improved in all kinds of ways. And David, talked um, a little bit about climate change issues. But um, so in, in, that, in, in the case where you want a subsidy, it will be justified on the basis of benefits that don't accrue to the individual, uh, individual farmer. This can also be understood without subsidy. Uh, the examples that I showed, the work I did with uh, Madeline Dunk and the work I've done with Linda and with David, we, we had a real interest rate on the debt to cover the government cost of borrowing. Uh, we found no leakage from the system. Uh, bankruptcy won't, won't mean there'll be avoidance. You can't, on the way it's designed, it can't be given, or probably can't be given away. The debt has to be settled before it's sold or given away. So in, when, you, when these systems are designed, they can be designed without a subsidy. So uh, it's not a critical aspect of this to think about it in subsidy terms. You can have it if you want, and you justify it on the basis of the spillover for society. I don't know how you measure that, but um, these systems are really about using an instrument that the government can deliver 
because the government has legal jurisdiction to know what the uh, revenue stream is of a property. And that's why it belongs in, in the government world. But being involved, being a government instrument doesn't imply a subsidy. It doesn't have to. You could actually make a profit from it if you wanted to. I don't recommend that. But you could put a, a surcharge, for example, of 10% on the debt with a real interest rate and the government would actually be getting more back. And the reason that works is that it's such a valuable thing to have income smoothing that is so precise or much more precise than a normal commercial loan. Great. Thanks, Bruce. I wonder, David, if you might say a few words about um, the carbon as a value, as an income stream to farmers. Um, basically, can you see any relationship between the RCL and the and the carbon income stream, David? Uh, wow, well, that's a good question. I, I would really need to have a deep think about it. I think one of the one of the issues is there's actually been surprisingly few measurements of, of, of and I mean true measurements, not modelled, but true measurements of how much carbon there can be, in in some of the, some of the natural assets on farms. Um, the little bit of work that's been done suggests that it's potentially a very large amount, partly because Australian trees in particular have a lot of biomass relative to how much moisture there is in the system. It's quite different from the rest of the world. And also a lot of our, our timber tends to, to degrade and decompose very slowly. So there's one of the things that we've been thinking deeply about is, okay, so you're going to put shelter belts in to increase your, your lambing success or provide more shade. Um, there, there should be ways to start to think about additional income streams from the carbon capture that's associated with that. So that's that. what's needed there is the methodology to help guide that from a state and federal level. The other thing that's important is that, for example, renovating farm dams and improving their condition potentially has enormous impacts on uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from, from the agricultural sector. We know from the little bit of work that's been done in the in by Deakin University that um, emissions from dams in poor conditions are really quite substantial, especially as they're very high greenhouse gas forcing um, emissions, particularly nitrous oxide and, and methane. So there's a lot to be gained in that space in terms of Australia's carbon account. I think farmers that are undertaking these kinds of investments and management interventions can actually make a huge difference in that space. A rough back of the envelope estimates are that renovating a proportion of the farm dams in the Murray-Darling Basin alone uh, potentially would get us pretty close to the equivalent of the landfill sector. So there's a lot of gains to be made here and, and positive ones that lead to better productivity, um, uh, better, better farm condition, better so, uh, animal welfare outcomes for livestock that aren't drinking terrible water but also better greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there's there's a lot more work to be done in that whole of farm space in terms of carbon, but also thinking about additional income streams for farmers based on, on how much carbon is being stored in their, in, in their farm systems. Thanks, David. So there's a question from YouTube. Um, uh, for young farmers who are just starting to build up farm business, do you think this kind of loan can be useful? So I'm wondering, Bruce, if you might want to have a comment uh, ab about that. And, and what if they've inherited a farm business that has already got a standard bank debt associated with it? So, yeah, Bruce, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know that both Mark and Ash talked about the um, appropriateness or the relative appropriateness of revenue contingent loans for young farmers. and I think it's useful to put this in the context of farm management deposits. So farm management deposits have been touched on. They're basically a way in which farmers can use savings with tax subsidies for bad years. So particularly like in drought, um, you have money put away in a farm management deposit, which can be drawn from in a bad time. What a revenue contingent loan does is kind of the same idea, but it's the other side of the coin. It says, imagine you're going to have good years in the future, which you will, as reflected by revenue. Would you like to take some of that revenue 
largesse from the future and give it to yourself now. So it's really a revenue contingent loan is kind of the future side of the, the farm management deposit coin, which is based on past uh, revenue experience or past profit experience or farm management deposits. It's particularly useful for young farmers because they wouldn't have established enough history to, wouldn't have had enough history to um, have farm management deposits. So I think the, the distinction between mature and young younger farmers with respect to revenue contingent loans is very useful and they're more important. I think they're extremely important across potentially across the board, but particularly uh, for young for young farmers. I don't know if it matters if um, a farm is inherited with a commercial debt obligation. Presumably that happens all the time. I don't think that that would get in the way of the appropriateness or efficacy of a revenue contingent loan. Uh, remember the, the size of the parameters. We've modelled it on the basis of 8% of revenue. That's the most extreme, but we've actually, uh, in all the work we've done, had somewhere between two and eight, usually at about 5%. So these are not burdens that are going to uh, infringe particularly on the capacity of the farm to be seen as uh, financially healthy. They will make it more financially healthy in my view because they'll make it more uh, straightforward for farms to actually pay off commercial debt because they'll have another uh, pocket of finances which can be used when times are tough to repay a bank. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, we've got a question from Claire that I thought perhaps Asha might put to you uh, first. Claire's, Claire's asking whether we believe that revenue contingent loans should be part of a suite of financial products available to farmers, um, including stewardship payments. So I'm wondering, Ash, how you would see a revenue contingent loan sitting alongside existing grant programs and environmental stewardship. You know, what, 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 um, how could that suite work? Coherently. Very good question. Now, I think um, there was a question in the comments around um, this as well. So, I think one of the issues with um, providing environmental services through a, a biodiversity offset or carbon offset is that there's upfront costs um, that the farmer will have to pay, and then the, the benefits or the financial payments come many years afterwards. And so, there's a, there's a gap between where the costs fall to the farmer and where the benefits. Um, accrue to the farmer. The revenue contingent loan could be the bridge between those two issues as, as a first step. And we get a lot of people involved um, in providing these environmental services where otherwise they might not. Now, in terms of it sitting beside other sort of um, programs, it, it's, it's very attractive, not just from an environmental services perspective, but a risk management perspective. It becomes a valuable source of off-farm income, um, particularly if we have markets for environmental services. Um, and it, it, it's a set of in, it's an income stream that's not correlated with climate or weather, which is very important for farmers. So when you have a drought and if you were part of a you know, biodiversity offset scheme, that's not contingent on what's going on with the weather or rain or, or climate. So it does sit quite well with the, the suite of measures um, um, in this space. Thanks. Do you want to add anything to that, Bruce? No, it just sounded wonderful to me. Yes. Well, I mean, there's a question here about whether or not you've presented any of this work um, previously to, to government, um, Bruce. A couple of people are asking what engagement you've had either from Commonwealth or state governments uh, around the RCL. And I know that in the past you um, worked on this with Linda Bottrell around drought policy, but in the context of this project, we're very much focused on it being around regeneration. So do you want to talk a little bit about how that engagement with government's gone on the RCL over the years? It hasn't been formal. We haven't uh, presented to government um, except on an ad hoc basis. I gave a seminar to Treasury economists maybe four or five years ago. I think governments over the years have been aware of what we're, we're what we've been doing and the modelling. Uh, we have spoken to some ministers over the over the decades about how all this might work, uh, but it hasn't been taken up. It hasn't been rejected. It just is kind of lurking and waiting for some enthusiastic responses. I think when we've got groups like Rick and um, NFF. Uh, showing 
positive interest, that will be a big plus for the, the substance of this debate in, in terms of potential public policy action. Okay, and um, we've got a question here from John asking whether or not corporate ownership um, is a is a, um, a barrier to 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 RCL to getting a revenue contingent loan. Can corporates do that as well? In principle, but all the modelling that we've been doing was not on the basis of, of non corporate farms, and that's why you'll see with the revenue uh, in the table, the revenue streams in the categories that we had in the in table in the table I presented that we had a maximum of $5 million average revenue. So we were mainly focusing on the non-corporate sector and uh, in principle, contingent debt can be handled in all, in all sorts of ways. It's more sophisticated with corporations because they can move assets around differently. We haven't really done that much uh, work on that side of it. Uh, so I think the answer is, in principle, maybe, but the details are always critical, but the work has been motivated by those farm properties with annual revenues of uh, 5 million or, or, or less. Um, great. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Another question to you is, is it possible to, um, uh, Lachlan James is asking, is it possible to do a private sector version of this to trial its applicability? Um, you know, could it be set up uh, through some sort of fund, like a philanthropic fund, or through a, a, you know private financial arrangements? The answer is that the financing can come from anywhere, but the collection cannot. This is one of the critical points to understand the role of government. Government has a legal jurisdiction to know what a citizen's income is, thus it can collect hex or to know what a firm or a business's revenue or profits are, because that's the basis of taxation. Uh, that is not true and could even be constitutionally invalid for the private sector. So, uh, I mean, I'm an economist, and so naturally we think, oh, business is a good idea and we like competition. Of course we do. But the institutional realities and the legal side of all this imply that the collection mechanisms at this point would be the government jurisdiction. But you could have the financing coming from the commercial sector, philanthropically or from a bank. In fact, we did, we had an arrangement like this called the Ostudy Loan Supplement, in which uh, in, it was instituted in 1993, where the income support system for students was being topped up by um, people trading in their income support for a doubled level of a, a hex debt. And the government at the time was nervous anxious about the optics of uh, big outlays. So they actually tended for the Commonwealth Bank to provide the money, knowing that the government would collect the money through the uh, taxation system. So the bottom line is the financing can come from anywhere. If it does come from a bank or some other agency, the government has to make an arrangements to repay them. But the collection at this point has to be a function of the public sector. Okay, Bruce, I was wondering also if you had any comments to make about um, Mark's comment about insurance products, about how the RCL would relate to, to, to insurance products. Not being an economics person, that's, I'm not quite sure if there are relationships, but I'll hand it to you. Well, there's, these, these instruments, are, as, as Mark alluded to, they're all, they're all about insurance. They're about uh, insuring against repayment hardships when times are tough. They're about insurance against uh, foreclosure on a property, uh, insurance against default. The whole bigger issue, tougher issue, more sophisticated issue of overall insurance for uh, income vagaries and uncertainty, we haven't ventured down that path. We've been fairly specific about the use of revenue contingency without trying to put it into uh, a more broadly based and sophisticated context of overall insurance. So I don't really feel qualified to comment on, on the bigger picture. Okay. Um, can I just hand a question to, to David? Um, David, there was an earlier question about uh, from Cecilia about how we measure the, um, the net benefits on farm. And Mossy has also put in a question about, have we looked at the idea of linking environmental health and property pr prices 
So I just wondered, David, if you talk a bit more about um, where we're at in terms of the space of, of measuring uh, the benefits of sustainable farm management and, and recognising it. Yeah, there's a lot of dimensions to that to, to that question and, and obviously also to the answer to that question. So um, yes, it is possible to measure a, a, a range of, of changes in condition over time. And that can be done both, for example, with satellites, but also on ground. And I think the on ground monitoring of how how some of these things are changing is really important. Um, in, in terms of net benefits, there's also a component of the Sustainable Farms Project that's looking at farmer wellbeing and farmer mental health. And there is a signal in that, in that work. Perhaps that's a, the basis for another webinar from the mental health people in the in the initiative across the you know, that spans the the link between financial health and mental health is really quite important and there's very strong connections there but there's also a connection between farmer mental health and environmental condition of farms it's a weaker effect but it's still there as you, you kind of expect so i think there are other other things that haven't been looked at in this space that are harder to quantify that'll be that it, that will be important for example um, the, the, the benefits of having less farmer suicides in an area is obviously really quite significant, but it's, there's some work to do to, to work out how to, to map the, those uh, mental health black spots and the like. In addition to some of the other, the other aspects of, as, as we move ahead with, for example, issues around certification schemes and stewardship schemes and how management interventions uh, may assist farmers in being able to to have their their products from the farm gate certified to then be uh, be accessible to other particular markets so there's there's a, a lot of thinking in this space in terms of not only financial sustainability but access to other markets as i mentioned briefly in my talk there's legislation in some countries in europe presently being examined for example in germany looking about the looking at the supply chain and what's the sustainable um, credentials, as it were, of, of particular products coming from particular areas. And Sustainable Farms has worked with other organisations that have been looked at sustain, looking at sustainable sourcing of product to then go into high end, uh, for example, fashion items. So yes, I think there's going to be other aspects of in the net benefit space. And we haven't really touched on animal welfare yet. For example, you know, there's clearly going to be, as time goes on, issues around animal shade with extra extra high temperatures that we're starting to see, but also access to, to clean water is, is, is also going to be part of animal welfare, welfare, amongst other things. So, you know, it's a complex space and many dimensions to it. So it's not necessarily an easy thing to answer quickly, but um, I might take that one on notice and add a little bit more in, in responses as time goes on as well. Okay, great. Thanks, David. Just following up on that, I mean, apart from, so for people to participate in a scheme like this, do you think there would need to be a minimum bar, a baseline of, of environmental performance that that farm, you know, the farmer um, has achieved some sort of measurement to make, to determine whether they're eligible or not? I, I think there would need to be a couple of things. One is that there would need to be an assessment of whether what was proposed was, was, a, was a reasonable thing. You know, I would I would be saying that you know this idea of having a penguin farm in Alice Springs may not be a sensible thing to be investing in, but you know establishing um, smaller smaller paddocks with interspersed with shelter belts is obviously something that would be would be worthwhile investing. So I think there needs to be some vetting in the process that way. I also think that there needs to be some monitoring associated with this to be able to to really understand what is good practice and how do things change through time and how can we quantify that so that um, so that there can be some confidence in the in the financial industry that what's being proposed is being done is actually being realized on the ground so we can if we want for example a beef sustainability framework or a sheep sustainability framework we can actually demonstrate there is improvement and when there has been a management intervention that leads to a better outcome and we will need to do some monitoring to be able to demonstrate you know, why a wider shelter belt seems to work better than a narrower one. 
and and how is it better and and to to give people some certainty around the kinds of interventions that they're doing actually produce a good outcome that's important that's really important so that it it has credibility it's more than not just arm waving to say oh i think we're doing better it's actually having the numbers there to show that we really are doing better and we're doing better in these ways and the data show why we're doing better in this space in this space so um, a return on investment not only a financial return on investment but an environmental condition return on investment as well okay thank you david mark can i just um give a, give you a question from adam Adam's asking, how um, do we get banks to start viewing carbon as an asset as opposed to a liability? Yeah, uh, I think Dave was touching on this earlier. Um, I'm also on the Climate Change Authority as well, so I'm bored on that, so I sort of get, get some optics on this. Um, they already are, uh, in, particularly in the rangelands, through um, one of the particular methodologies is human-induced revegetation. Um, banks are now having to deal with the issue of carbon revenue streams from uh, from properties and more particularly how it goes to the bottom line or, or the valuation of the place and uh, because they in most cases because they are required to give consent they need to understand the impact of these carbon projects on 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 the on the business so they are by default having to deal with this. Uh, I wouldn't say it's completely widespread yet and still very uh, in a, immature in a way from the banking's perspective, but I do see it as a way forward and there are significant funds could be coming into agriculture from carbon farming and linking in with insurance and linking in with things like you know, uh, contingent uh, debt and those sorts of things as, as a holistic package. I think we've got a long way to go, but I think we're on the on the cusp of, of, of that. And I, it's probably a pretty exciting space to be in, in over the next three, four years. Again, I, I do see carbon as a driver because carbon is very much linked to productivity. Um, the productivity is very much linked to the resource base and the resource condition of the, the enterprise. So it's all a bit of a circular loop for me. And um, uh, I don't think you can sort of take one bit out of it from the other. Um, and we have to look at that in that context going forward. So do you think that we're, um, uh, um, as one of the um, questioners has put it, do you think we're heading towards a national approach to integrating finance for rural enterprises where people have got choice and opportunity around environmental outcomes as well as business outcomes? So bringing those things together, do you think that's actually coming along? Yeah, that's going to be driven by the revenue streams coming from these uh, alternate sources, if you like, like biodiversity credits and um, these resource-based resource uh, resource revenue streams. So they will naturally have to come together anyway. Um, and I think it is a bit of a challenge for a, you know, the traditional banking sector to, to get their head around um, because it's coming. Um, and they're going to have to deal with it. Uh, and, and likewise, RIP will have to deal with it as well in terms of um, uh, the way that we, we look at our, I guess, traditional banking model, which is, again, traditionally bank based on asset uh, securitisation, land-based asset securitisation. So we're going to have to look at these other revenue streams that have got a huge potential, but also increase the productivity of, of, of the resource base. Okay, um, I've got to thank you. Thank you, Mark. I've got another question about age. Um, it's basically, what are your thoughts, Bruce, on the um, role of contingent loans for the over 60s? The debt is not tied to the individual farmer the, or, the, or the business owner generally. The debts are linked to the Australian business number. So they're debt of the property. So it really, when we we're first thinking about this um, and talking to Michael Egan, the rural accountant, that was one of the critical points that we could facilitate the operational aspects of all this. So it didn't matter uh, if somebody was on the cusp of not being a farmer any longer, like leaving the property or, or perhaps being quite old, because it wasn't their personal debt. It isn't their personal debt. It is linked to the Australian business number. It would have to be made 
unique. You can't have two or three. So the legislation would have to be designed to, to make that uh, workable. And this allowed us not to worry too much or to be happy that it would work in the event of gifting, like through inheritance or through sale. And Michael's suggestion, there were two, there were two possible possibilities, that the debt, because it's tied to the property, would therefore the price of the property, if it was being sold, would take that into account. Um, that's, that's the first point. So then it doesn't really matter uh, if, if that economics works. But the other thing is it would be a requirement that in the event of the change of ownership, that the, prop, that the debt be settled somehow perhaps through a commercial debt but I think it's all I think it's all workable and I've got a we've got a paper that we wrote with Michael um, quite a long time ago it's about the real nitty-gritty technical accounting and legal issues to do with this and uh, of course that's I'm very happy to send that great thank you Bruce well I think um, we've basically answered all of the questions some of them are a little more, more complicated around carbon um, and I think we can have a little bit of a crack of that in the summary that we that we put out I mean it's been fantastic the range of questions that we've had and I think we've covered quite a few issues so I'll hand it now to Tamara thanks Michelle um, that was a really gosh I think I learned so much from you all thank you so much we will be putting together some uh, some more resources for everyone who registered or attended just another link to the papers and any other papers that have come up and we might dive into some of those more complex questions uh, as well. Um, and also remember, you can check out other resources available on the NFF website or RIC website or our own website. And if you do have any questions or follow-up questions, please feel free to shoot us an email. Um, the recording will be available in a day or so, um, and we will send that to everyone that's registered. But in the meantime, thank you very much, everybody and enjoy the rest of you on Monday. And thank you to our speakers.